Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Gary Matsuoka, and we're here at Laguna Hills Nursery in Santa Ana on a Saturday morning. And today's topic is uh, organic controls or pesticides for the organic garden. So, if you're growing things to eat, you're growing things because you want to be better than the stuff at the supermarket. Uh, generally, it's cheaper to buy them at the store than it is to grow them yourself, although, uh, there can't, you know, a lot of us who've been doing this for a long time, there's no yearly expense. It's just to start when you first create your garden, that the, that's the biggest expense. But to keep it going is not so bad. But we do like to use things that we consider safe. Now, unfortunately, it is difficult to grow most of the garden stuffs without having some kind of help. I mean, there are plants now if you're not squeamish you can grow tomatoes and just pick off those big green worms uh and then you can be you know pretty much organic or you know no no pesticides needed for that um or if you're growing onions generally they don't require much in the way of pest control but most plants we run into we run into trouble now the most important thing to do in a garden is control ants the Argentine ants we have, not native to California, their main job or their main goal in their life is to farm sucking bugs. And that's things like aphids, uh, mealybugs, scale, and whitefly. Those are the sucking bugs. And the reason they farm them is because the sucking bugs suck on the plant and much of their excrement is sugar water and that's the ants food so the ants will take the white flies from the weeds and put them on your favorite uh, say squash plants and protect them from the ladybugs who want to eat them there's no ant in your garden uh, there's a lot of natural controls ladybugs lace wings lots of uh, parasitic uh, wasp and flies that'll eat the bad bugs but if the ants are there they mess that balance up so that's number one. Unfortunately, uh, we lost our source of um, organic ant control. Now, you can make your own. Um, if you go to a pharmacy, you can buy boric acid. So this is for ant control. Uh, boric acid is a kind of a powder or liquid and it's considered in in the gardening I mean there's a lot of things in gardening that are weird because boric acid is considered organic even though it's kind of it's not safe to drink you know but it's considered natural so <clears throat> I guess it's found in nature in pure form, which means, uh, you know, they just mine it and get it that way. But boric acid and sugar is a combination. It's like 1% to 2%. So a, a farming friend, a farmer that we know, uh, they said that they just get a, a plastic bottle, you know, used plastic bottle, and fill it with, granulated sugar which the ants will love to pick up and then they mix about one to two percent boric acid with it and the ants will eat the sugar and the boric acid kills them when they eat it uh, they said it keeps the numbers low it doesn't get, eliminate them totally but it keeps the numbers low the other product that we used to have was called ant pro was uh, created in Florida, but apparently they're not manufacturing the product or the dispenser anymore. And it was essentially the same thing, boric acid and a sugar solution. Uh, they had a liquid solution and a liquid dispenser that they had the ants can get in that, that the other animals couldn't get into. Uh, so you can probably create something like that too. And they just had all the organic farmers set it in their farms. Uh, every, they said every 500 square feet, they'd put one of these things out there, or 5,000, I think it was 500 square feet. Uh, and just keep them out there all year. The ants are pretty much active, most active between April and November. So, um, 
So something with bark acid and sugar. We do carry the non-organic one. Can't believe I didn't bring it up here. Well, I'm going to show it to you anyway because it is an important product. <clears throat> so this is Amdro. Now, there are other products like this on the market. This is the one we can get a hold of. I know there's others out there that are very similar to the same. So the nice thing about this sand control is you don't have to put it in your garden. The ants will find it. It is a bait. So this, and most of the ant controls that are out there that really work really well are, are based on the same thing. It's cornmeal. So the ants love cornmeal mixed with some vegetable, which is like their favorite food. Besides sugar, it's their favorite food. And uh, they'll go, they'll find it and they'll take it. So what they do with this product is they put a slow acting poison, a slow acting poison in it. So in the past, what we've had were granules you'd, just shake around if the ants got close to it and killed them. Well, those were nerve poisons. I mean, you know, we don't want those. We don't like those around anything edible. This one, they'll find it and they'll eat it and it doesn't kill them for three days. So they have an opportunity if you put out enough at one time to kill off the entire neighborhood colony. Because <laughs> the Argentine ants work with super colonies where they have little side colonies that are all the same colony and then they have a major center um, so when this came out we brought it to California in the year 2000 to control fire ants that had made it back from back east here fire ants are very close to laid dark and teens they do a lot of the same things uh, but when we tried this in our garden you know we used to have a house a fairly new house at that time with ant trails running inside the house that were that wide you know <laughs> Just, just terrible ants. And then we put this out twice in our yard that year. And in my neighborhood, no one in my neighborhood saw ants for 15 years. <laughs> so we must have got the big colony. We put out two of these in one year. This normally covers about a half acre. And we did it twice and apparently got, and we had a quarter acre lot. So uh, we apparently, and we, you know, we put it in the green belt area behind our house too. So we apparently got the major colony in the area. Yes. Right, you don't have to put it near the plants that you want to protect because it's a bait. They actually will seek it out and find it. You just need, they said, two or three hours before the sprinklers are on or you know after the rain or something like that. You don't want it to be washed away. And it is nice to have a fairly fresh batch of this because the cornmeal does get stale after a while sitting on the shelf. The black containers I have of this are the freshest ones we have. But so even though it's not organic, uh, the ants aren't native here, and they do a lot of bad things in the garden. So it's it looks like cornmeal. This you can find it either as a powder or a liquid. Uh, so you can use it. You know you can liquid. You can put liquid sugar. I mean you can put water in with sugar in it and bark it. The liquid bark acid in there. As long as it's around one to two percent, and usually the boric acid tells you how much. So, so those are your ant controls. That's real important. Now, the most important thing we've gotten in in organic control in the last generation is a chemical called spinosad. Um, it's made, it's really, it's made organic gardening possible because <laughs> before we didn't have this, we didn't have anything to control certain bugs without chemicals and it was just tough. So spinosad is considered a natural ingredient because it's made by bacteria in a, dis well, they said they found it in a wine, um, not a wine distillery, a, uh, rum distillery. So it's bacteria they found in a rum barrel, and it makes breaks down. I guess rum is uh, a sh a cane sugar, 
breaks it down and creates not only uh, alcohol, but this chemical called spinosad. And since spinosad is in many types of rum, they consider it that it doesn't hurt mammals at all. Apparently, we, people have been drinking this. So, spinosad, what's nice about it, it kills chewing insects. Except for the brown grasshoppers, it kills most chewing insects, and it also kills thrips. And these are really, the thrips have become the, the big problem in the industry is the damage and the diseases they spread. So the main product we've carried over the years with spinosad in it is uh, Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew, which is kind of playing on the rum thing in the Caribbean islands. So, um, now the problem with this product is it, it doesn't stick well to certain plants with waxy leaves. So, most vegetables, no problem. I mean, it'll stick to tomato leaves and cabbage pro you know, leaves and things like that. But you have waxy leaves like when we spray it on citrus leaves to control the little uh, leaf miners. It doesn't stick to the new growth. The new growth is too waxy. And when we spray it on roses to control thrips, it doesn't stick to the rosebuds because they're too waxy. So we do add a wetting agent, which is not organic. Now, we used to have an organic wetting agent. They don't make it for California anymore. It's like we get the bad end of a lot of this stuff. But the only, the only wetting agent we can find from our supplier is this one, which is not organic, but it essentially it's just soap. So you can use soap as a wetting agent now. Some wetting agents are really weird, so we don't use this in the nursery anymore because it makes the roses grow funny. It's got a slight phytotoxic effect. It also makes tomatoes stretch strangely. It doesn't hurt them that much, but it makes them do funny things. So in the nursery, we get this wetting agent called No Foam B, which doesn't cause that trouble. It's the soap. The problem is, this is the only size that comes <laughs> So this is enough, you know, if you, you bought this in your home, you'd never use it all. Uh, it's, we use this up in about a year and a half here. So I can imagine a homeowner would take 10 years to use it. I guess it'll last for 10 years. But, uh, you know, this is like $28. It's not that expensive, but it's just a lot to buy. Uh, so if you, you can try dish soap like Ivory or Don or Joy. So, so, so you <clears throat> mix the, the, um, the dish soap in the spinosad to make it stick onto the Right. So what will be the uh, solution? Okay, so <clears throat> when you're using, so the problem we have here is our water's hard. It's got too many minerals in it. So on plants, if we had soft water like they have on the East Coast, it would probably stick better. But what you'll see is that it just beads up. The water just, the spray just beads up on the leaf, doesn't cover it. So if you add the right amount of soap, which may be two or three drops per quart of water, just drops, um, then it'll form a film and cover the leaf. If you add too much soap, it runs off the leaf, won't even stay on it. So that's what I've been told is the way, you know, we know if we add the right amount of the wetting agent that I just showed you, it forms a nice film. If we don't add it, it tends to beat up. So, uh, and if, if, again, if you add too much, it runs right off. So you can kind of check it on a small scale that way just by adding a, a few drops at a time and see how much it takes to make it stick. So most of these products we sell three ways. Uh, this is a concentrate. This is a concentrate that has a proportional for your hose. And this is a ready mixed one that you can just spray on by itself. So this one's already diluted. Um, so this is a better buy than those two, but you know this is real easy just to take it out there and spritz the plant. Uh, again, this doesn't have a wetting agent in it. Now you can pop the top off and put a few drops of soap in here. Uh, but check out and see your brand of soap, how much it takes to make a film on a plant. 
Um, now we now just so you know, this type of spread, the host proportioners are not that accurate. This is accurate when it's already pre-mixed like this, because this depends on because this pulls the water from pulls the chemicals out here and mixes with the water going through. It's not always perfect. Um, because we notice if we turn the hose sideways, then it stops pulling it out. If you, you know, there's things you can do to your hose to, to make change the flow of water that messes up that connection. So it's not as accurate as having your own, having this, or having your own pressure sprayer, either a sprayer like, like this type, where you mix it first and then put it in. This is another type of pressure sprayer which is easier on the fingers. I mean, you know, if you have one of these in about 30 seconds, you, your finger starts cramping up. You have to change, you have to change fingers until you run out of fingers and you have to start over again. This one, you just pump it up and they'll spray for about 20 seconds before you have to pump it again. Now in the nursery, we use a backpack sprayer. And the, and if you have a big garden, this is a nice thing to get. I mean, these things run about $200. It's four gallons. Um, the nice thing about this is this can build up a lot of pressure. 75 pounds per square inch, which in itself is enough to knock a whole bunch of bugs off your plant. I mean, one of our first things we ever had was just, you know, on the end of your hose, you put on one of these these valves and you turn on just slightly so it's a nice sharp stream I mean for a while they were selling the bug blaster which was essentially a lawn sprinkler head on the end of a hose so it gives you a, a sharp stream that wasn't too much volume but this <laughs> does the same thing and a lot of the small bugs if you you know if you went to your garden and blast water every week you wouldn't have that many bugs it's a bit of work though so to do that work. Uh, but some, um, like the Portland Rose Garden, said that what they found is you know, they were watering the roses with um, drip system. Well, they decided to go and put sprinklers in their system, in their rose garden also, and they said turning on the sprinklers for just two minutes every morning kept about 70% of the bugs off the plants. Water? Yeah, just spraying with water. Now, the thing about water and disease, you have to know is that the key on disease is if the water droplet sits there for more than four hours without moving, there's a chance you can get a disease in that leaf. So now in Portland, which is more equivalent to Corona, and there, if you've ever been to Portland in the summertime, it's like 90, 95 degrees every day. So it's drier climate, they're inland, even though they're, they're called Portland, they're 75 miles inland. So it's like Corona Riverside. Uh, the things do dry off fairly fast if you water in the morning. So here you'd have to watch the humidity and the temperature that day, make sure they dry off quickly um, if you want to hit them with water. But they said they the water, the sprinkling in the morning also eliminated a lot of the leaf diseases because most spores like that dew droplet sitting there, not moving. Uh, and they need it to be there for four hours. So you can imagine if, if you got a dew on your leaf, rose leaves in the morning and you wash them off and you leave in a fresh droplet of water, that dew spore has, that mildew spore or rust spore, whatever disease spore it is, needs another four hours of uninterrupted water droplet to germinate and attack the leaf. But that by that time, it may, the water is dried off by, say, mid-morning, and then the disease doesn't have a chance. So, you know, when it's raining, the diseases can't attack the leaf. It's always the period after the rain stops that the leaf stays wet. That's when the diseases attack. So, uh, and most diseases like spring weather better than winter is too cold. So we get a lot of leaf diseases early spring when it starts warming up. So water is one method to control both bugs and diseases. Um, back in the 
60s, that's all we had for mildew on roses. You go out there and blast them every morning. I remember watching my dad do that, just get the hose out and blast the roses, get that mildew off of them. Um, okay, so Spinosad. Uh, now, another brand that we carry more now um, is Spinosad mixed with soap. So this sticks better. However, it's a lot more expensive. So if you can figure out how to mix your own soap with it, it's cheaper to get this one than this one. But this is already mixed with soap, and so is this. So, it, so we sell this for spraying you know, rosebuds for thrips. Uh, this brand also, yes. Well, dishwasher, I would use this, uh, this, this in the sink. Yeah. That you can safe on your hands, yeah. Mm -hmm. Another brand of Spinosad here. Are some of these they're not supposed to get water? Or is that just, just at the bottom where the dirt is? Uh, this is you know, that's where you're not supposed to you know, spray your... Um, well, most plants that's the only way to get water is from rain. So they're they're most plants are used to that. I mean there's some plants that if the water's on there too long, that's a problem. I mean, you know, that's that's true with almost any plant. If the water sits there too long without drying off, they can get diseased. Uh, like this time of year, basil, well, basil, it's too cold for basil, but we do mention all the time to customers that if you get your, if you water your basil leaves at night, by the next morning, they can be totally infested, infected with uh, this downy disease that just turns them gray and they fall off. I mean, in the last 20 years, 25 years, we've had a lot of new diseases coming to the Western Hemisphere from the Eastern Hemisphere. <laughs> You know, people travel and they bring all these diseases home with them. And downy is something that came from Asia to uh, North America 20 years ago. And it, boy, it's a nasty disease. It just makes leaves turn yellow and drop on a lot of plants. Roses, onions, impatiens, basil, all different kinds of downy disease. So... So we have to keep those plants drier, <clears throat> especially at night. So anyway, Spinosad is the most important product out there. Uh, chewy insects, which include caterpillars, beetles, uh, pill bugs, uh, earwigs. There's a lot of chewing insects out there. Uh, green grasshoppers, or that what are called katydids, but it won't kill the big brown ones. Nothing kills those. There's nothing legal we have that kills those big brown grasshoppers. <laughs> um, and then thrips are the little bugs that suck on new growth and cause a whole bunch of trouble on roses, uh, tomatoes, peppers. Um, quite a few plants can, can get affected by thrips. Uh, we had a customer who has uh, had a 20 pound dog call up Andro company and ask him how much it would, because it is, you know, this is in a lot of pet food, uh, cornmeal. So we asked him how much of this that his dog would have to eat before it killed him. They told him two, two and a half pounds for the weight of his dog. He said two and a half pounds. So they have to eat two of these to kill them. So it's real low doses. I mean, they use this throughout parks and playgrounds in California or something like this because this is a heck of a lot safer to be around than the fire ants. So uh, that's used a lot in public areas. <clears throat> okay, so now for caterpillars, just so you know, There's another famous organic product out there called BT. We don't care anymore because this is way better than BT. So BT was a caterpillar disease, is a caterpillar disease that kills only cat 
Now the nice thing about it is it's very specific. It only kills caterpillars. It won't hear, hurt pillowbugs or beetles or anything else. It only kills caterpillars. But the shelf life on it was terrible. They said you had to use it within a season. And, you know, so we were throwing away cases of BT when we got in because we didn't sell enough of it. Um, and they make a new batch every year. Now, the way they make this is kind of gross. So they get a whole bunch of caterpillars and they get them all sick. They find a, a, a new version of the disease that makes them all sick. And then they freeze dry them, grind them up, and throw them in the container. So that's what they're selling is this dead bodies of caterpillars infested with this disease. Uh, and, they're, and you spray it over the garden and, it's, and it just wipes out all the caterpillars. <laughs> the other problem with this is that monarch butterfly caterpillars are super sensitive to that product. So they're sensitive to this too, but... Uh, <clears throat> okay, so, that, so we don't carry BT anymore, although we can get it for you if you really want that one. If you don't want to kill thrips or beetles or pill bugs. Oh, um, you can also get spinosad combined with snail control. I didn't bring the container up here, but there are, we do carry products that have, so they, for snails, the organic one is iron phosphate, snails and slugs. <coughs> And this year, the snails and slugs are a lot worse because we've had enough rain now for two years. Now, slugs can't get that far off the ground. They've got no shell to protect them. So only when it's raining do slugs get high on your plant. During the dry season, it's snails that can climb to the top of the tree and eat leaves at the top of the tree, too. Um... So this is the, one of the organic methods to control snails and slugs. Um, truthfully, it's not super, super effective. It won't kill every single one of them. So there, you, there's other methods to do it. Uh, now, if you have a tree, I didn't bring up here, but we do have a copper tape. So if you go to an orchard that's being cared for real nicely, you'll see copper bands around the trunks because snails can't cross metal. Apparently, the foot of a snail or a slug is a naked muscle. And if they try to touch metal, it just shorts them out. <laughs> so, so, so any kind of metal. Now, copper stays less corroded, I guess, and it's, maybe it's cheaper than stainless. I don't know. Uh, but uh, most orchards use copper bands. Now, if you want the proper copper band, I've seen it over at Orange County Farm Supply, which is this uh, um, copper foil, and they use copper uh, paper clips to hold it on the trunk of a tree, and it'll last forever. The copper tape that I sell will last about three or four months, but the stickiness of the tape kind of mess, gets messed up after a while. So, but we don't have a source for the copper banding that they do. The other method to control snails and slugs is to get a 2x4 piece of wood and support it off the ground with a couple rocks. So it's maybe a half inch clearance underneath it and then keep that area moist. Uh, snails and slugs like hiding under damp, shady spots in the daytime. So if you put this in your garden and you have any snails or slugs at all, pick it up crush what's underneath there and, and then put it back. And they said within a week or so, you can pretty much take care of any snail or slug. Now, a lot of people tell me they don't see in the daytime any snails or slugs. And they show me the holes in their leaves and we know it's snail damage. So when I was younger, I watched, I had this block wall that was, the top wasn't finished and there were snails in there. I go, there's no plants here. What are these snails going after? And I was single at that time, so I had time. So at 9 o'clock, they, they came down the wall. You know, it took them half hour to get down the wall. By midnight, they were at least 20 feet away 
in my asparagus patch eating the asparagus plants. And by, you know, the next morning they're back in the wall. I couldn't believe that. It's like a 50 foot round trip that they were doing, <laughs> you know, at snail's pace to get to the plants and back. Uh, so, yeah, they don't have to be on your plants in the daytime to eat your plants. They can be quite a distance. So, um, So if you have snails and slugs and you got wide leaves, they leave a they suck a hole in the middle of it. Whereas if you have grasshoppers and caterpillars, they usually start on the edge. Now baby caterpillars will eat holes in the middle of the leaf. Baby caterpillars are, and beetles will do this, but snails they can, it looks like they're sucking out their leaf big holes in the middle of the leaf round holes too. And they usually leave that silvery slime trail nearby too. So but most larger grasshoppers and caterpillars will just start from the edge. So okay, uh let's see. Now another bad bug in the garden which doesn't do horrendous amounts of damage, but they can. Uh, aphids, those little sucking bugs that get on your cauliflower and your broccoli and uh, uh, most of the new growth on many plants you get aphids on. Now, once we get to April, May, the ladybugs are out and they're doing a really good job controlling those as long as there's no ants. And we get aphids on new growth on citrus, new growth on stone fruit trees. And they can make all the leaves kind of roll up with their damage. So, again, if, you, if there's no ounce out there and the aphids don't do a horrendous amount of damage, they look terrible. They make everything sticky. Like on my roses at my house, we notice that they're on all the new growth. But by the time that first set of flowers has opened, the growth hardens and the aphids are gone because they can no longer suck on that mature growth. Uh, and they usually don't come back. And usually at the same time, the predator bugs are finding them and they're, they're killing them all off. So if you can stand the initial um, batch of aphids on your plant, usually by you know a few months down the road, they're gone because they can't suck anymore. But, uh, and we have a hard time killing aphids with a lot of products. Uh, the oil products like these products here so there's neem oil, there's mineral oil. I've done an okay job. They'll kill like 90% of them, but they don't, they don't seem to ever do 100%. Some of the new essential oils are doing a little better job on the aphids. So uh, the Dr. Earth essential oils. Um, so these are just single oils. This is just mineral oil. This is just oil from the neem seed. The Dr. Earth products um, called Final Stop, rosemary oil, sesame oil, peppermint oil, thyme oil, cinnamon oil, and garlic oil. And a lot of the farms and nurseries are happy with these products that are similar to this, or you know, this or similar to this, because when they're food grade material like this, um, well, this is interesting. Yeah. The EPA does not have to know. There's no EPA numbers on here. So whatever farms are here at the nursery, we use a product that has an EPA number on it. We have to report our use of this to the government. Even though it may be one ounce, we have to write it down and put notices for our workers that we're using this, we use this on this plant. Uh, but when you use something uh, that's kitchen safe, no one's got to say a word. A lot of these products are made for the marijuana industry. So Pure Crop One, which is um, soybean oil, corn oil, 
glycerin, carrot, onion, orange, and soap. Vanillin. So that's that can be used because it's all food grade stuff. So I don't know if you're aware of this, but two years ago, I think it was, no, three years ago, they were using this on marijuana, the neem oils, and they didn't pass the EPA inspection. That is the legal marijuana growers. They have to have the stuff tested to make sure there's no residue in it. And the neem, none of the, and the neem oil products were causing to have um, residue that wasn't safe according to the EPA. But they were, the marijuana growers were using the organic, uh, you know, supposed organic product. So they had to figure out what was going on. And what it turns out is, is the chemical companies that bottle the stuff do not clean their machinery between products. So a lot of these products are cross-contaminated with the product that went through the machinery, the measuring stuff before your product, uh, it got chemicals in it. <laughs> so that's the problem. And we don't know if they've ever fixed this from this company. I, I think, I believe Dr. Earth does all their own stuff. So it should not be cross-contaminated. Cross and that's what they're having to do is find factories that'll just do that one product. Uh, so that has been an issue. I don't know if you read about uh, these big tanker trucks that move juice one way and chemicals the other way in the same truck. <laughs> So anyway, um, they say they clean out the tanks between products. Okay. Um, so anyway, aphids, the Dr. Earth products work a little better on the aphids with the different, the mixtures of oils than the, than the single oils do. So now spider mites, which Spider mites in the past, all we had was controlling with water, with a nice stream of water. But the oils really do a good job, especially these two oils. Really do a good job on spider mites. So the minerals, which are all are labeled organic because they evaporate and they're gone, they don't leave any residue, have always been considered the best products to control spider mites better than the chemicals that they have that kill them the poisons, chemicals, they've always worked better. It's just that these are more expensive to the farms than the chemical ones are. So chemical ones, you, know, you can dilute them to, you know, uh, one fiftieth of a percent and it still works. Whereas the minerals are usually used at uh, four or five percent. So it costs the farms a lot more to use the mineral than it is some of the chemicals. But for homeowner use, this is as good as anything you can get. And it's, relatively safe. They're all OMRI listed for use. Uh, in the old days, and some literature still says don't do it uh, when it's real hot. Um, it's not as much a problem as it used to be. So 50, 60 years ago, the oils were contaminated with, well, especially the mineral, with sulfur. And sulfur and oil causes a lot of leaf tissue to burn. So we only use the oils on, say, fruit trees in the winter when it was cold or when they were dormant. But uh, nowadays, because they've been able to distill them better and get all the contaminants out, um, I mean, all these products, they usually list the sulfur content so that you know it's not... You know, superior or type mineral 92 percent i don't know the, i think on somewhere on the label they have a little book on the back they tell you how what the sulfur content now is so it's really low so it doesn't burn things neem actually has a lot of sulfur in it so this tends to burn leaves easier also has a weird smell 
Um, they actually put a fragrance in here, so it doesn't smell as bad as it used to, but you know it's still there. Uh, so we actually, the nursery, prefer using the minerals more because we don't smell them at all when we use them. But it's, um, so the oils kill spider mites better than anything else you can pretty much do. Besides, you know, water, when we used to control spider mites with water, we'd hit the plants once a week for three weeks in a row. Just blast them once a week. Uh, three consecutive weeks. The problem is, is they lay little eggs that you can't kill with the. Sometimes they, they, you know, the water doesn't wash them off, and you gotta take them off the next time they hatch. Good question. So most of these chemicals, we want to hit both sides. The oils tend to migrate themselves. So the oils, as the water evaporates out of the, you know, the water and the oil are mixed together. And when the water evaporates, the oil starts migrating around the leaf. So it seems to cover the leaf very nicely. As long as you do good jobs, you know, enough spray on the leaf, one side is good enough. Because we, we've looked at that over the past, and as the water droplet dries off, the entire leaf starts shining, the oil migrates around it. So, but yeah, it's nice to cover both sides. So, it, that's the advantage of having a sprayer with a wand on it so you can get underneath it and spray from the bottom up. So, a reasonable sprayer for homeowners would be this this is a two gallon tank sprayer, it's got a wand also. Now this is a middle of the road tank sprayer. So there are really nice tank sprayers. They're really cheap tank sprayers. The cheap ones, the hoses kink really easily. And they usually only last uh, a year, the cheap ones. Things like this should last two or three years. What happens on these is just the seals. So the pressurized seals are all rubber. And those uh, eventually either dry up or shrink. Now, what you do to fix that is put some, you know, a vegetable oil or mineral oil on them. Get them lubricated again, and sometimes it keeps it going for a while. I mean, 20, 30 years ago, we used to sell the parts for these. You can't even get them anymore. You just have to buy a new one. Okay, I think we covered most of the bugs that we can kill. Or our insects, anyway. Um, another one that can be a nasty problem, especially if you have sandy soil, are the root knot nematodes. Now, most nematodes, nematodes are microscopic worms that live in the ground. Most of them are good guys. So nematodes kill insects. They'll eat, in, eat grubs and things that live in the ground. But there are some nematodes that go after plant roots. And what they do to them, the most plant roots should look like, like this nice slender, like spider webs going through the soil. When you get root knot nematodes, it looks like a strings of uh, curdled cheese, like cottage cheese. So everything's knotted up and bumpy. Uh, and the plant, this doesn't grow well. Now, there are um, beneficial bacteria on roots of certain plants that make little nodules too, but they're not on the center of the root. So when you see like a bean plant, which is the legume, which has root nodules on it, they come off the sides like that. But if your entire root is just all bumpy and like this, then that's root knot nematodes. Ah, didn't bring the product. Up. We actually have a product on the shelf. Oh, let me bring it here.
So this is uh, nematode control. It's armory listed because all it is is a soap. I haven't tried this yet. We just saw this on the market last year, and I, and I haven't had a situation yet to try it in. Um, so they're saying that this soap in the ground will kill these, hopefully they don't kill the good nematodes, because we sell nematodes that control grubs and flea larvae, maggots, um, and all the bugs live in the ground, you can control with good nematodes. Um, like we're selling a snake oil. <laughs> but there's a little package in here that claims that there's five million beneficial nematodes. You soak this in water and then you spray it in a tank spur of some sort or a watering can over a certain area and then uh, the nematodes swim into the soil and go after all these bugs and they'll last for about a year or so. Well, the ne well, when you have the root knot nematodes, your plants just don't look good. So when I had it, I've had it on three plants. The plants will sit there and not grow. And you just check the soil. You just dig in the soil a little bit to see how the roots look, and they're all knotted up. Like I had uh, my first south of the had 20 fig trees, and one of them just was not growing. And I dug around the roots, and the roots were all knotted up. Uh, and then I had another plant, a white sapote, that looked at the roots, and they're all knotted up also. Now, back then, we didn't have any of these controls, but what I had learned was that cool season grasses are immune to nematodes because the roots put out chemicals that kill them. So what I did, and I've never seen this written, so I can't promote this officially, but I'll tell you anyway, because it, it worked for us several times. We just grew cool season grasses over the root system of those trees. And we left the tree there. We grew, this is ryegrass, which sprouts in three days this time of year. Grew it for three months, pulled the grass out, and looked at the roots of the trees, and we saw no more nodding. Um, and every time I've done it with, when I've had the problem, I've had it three times now. Fig, white sapote, and I think the last one was, I don't know what tree it was. Banana tree had knotty roots, and every time I just grew some cool season grasses. See, you know you can get the weeds that come up in the winter. Those are cool season grasses. Uh, we've used oats in a front bed out here, and it seemed to work. So all cool season grasses, the roots put out. Not the warm season grasses don't work. Bermuda, Saint Augustine, which are warm season grasses, don't work. But our textbook does say cool season grasses are immune to root knot nematodes. So, you can, you can get them. So any, the root knot nematodes uh, exist in soils that are very airy. So if you have a real sandy soil, they can't live in clay. They can't breathe in it. So clay soils, you don't get nematodes, but in our own potting soil that we sell is, is very, very airy, so we can get them in there too. It's, it has worked for me. <laughs> since I don't have a, since I don't, you know, uh, what they always say is you have to have a research document that proves it. Um, to show that it works. So now there's supposed to be a certain marigold that they found. Uh, not this one. A certain marigold that they found that you can grow it on a farm and then mix it with the dirt, and it lowers the nematode uh, amount of nematodes. And it's not the roots of these; it's the foliage that they have to bury into the farm to get the nematode count down. And, some people have also said, well, if you put compost around, it kills nematodes. 
Well, the reason why compost does that is because it lowers the oxygen level of the soil, so the, the nematodes all suffocate. Your plant roots will do the same thing, though. You get too much compost mixing with your dirt, the roots of your plants suffocate, too, and then they, they get root rot. So I wouldn't recommend putting organic matter and tilling it in like we used to do. Um, so, but you won't have nematodes. <laughs> Yes. Well, in general, so they've they've did studies with marigolds and cabbage. The University of California actually did a study to see how beneficial it was, and they said, yeah, if you surround the cabbage plant with marigolds. It gets far fewer bugs than if you don't. But what they found in the farm was, is there was, you'd have to grow as much marigold as you did cabbage. And they said the farms that didn't use the marigolds and just let the bugs eat the cabbage, when they harvested the cabbage, they just pulled off the eaten leaves and they still had more cabbage without the marigolds than they did with it. Because this took up half the property. So, but it is an orga you know, organic way to do it. So if you have enough land, then putting these in your garden will help. Any, actually, it's almost any plant that smells, because bugs find their targets by smell, and if you disrupt their smell enough, uh, it kind of messes up their search for the plant. Um, a farm, an organic farm I know, they surround every crop with onions which I guess kind of does the same thing. Nothing like onions. Garlic, I would assume, would do the same thing. For your patio, no. I'm, not, I'm talking about like a patio area. If you do enough so, um, aromatic plants, it'll keep away the mosquitoes. No. no research has shown that it's worked, okay. unfortunately. I mean, the mosquito stopping plants all have these chemicals in them that repel the mosquitoes, but unless you crush the leaves, you don't get the smell out. Like lemongrass, certain geraniums, unless you sit there and you just stomp on the plants, uh, it doesn't stop them. So we still sell those things because people keep demanding them. But so far, I mean, you know, here we got the plants here, we still get eaten alive in the summertime by this, you know, the new species of mosquitoes that fell and came in. Okay, let's see. So, of course, we've got weeds, too, to worry about. So, I do a lot of this. <laughs> a lot of hand-picking, and then once you hand pick it, then it's nice to cover the ground so the weeds don't come up again. So bark, we have the garden straw, you know, in your vegetable garden, you put on at least two inches of garden straw, the weeds don't have a chance of getting started again once you pick them. Um, the other thing we brought in is vinegar. The store vinegar, 5% is too weak. If you get 30% vinegar, which can really clean your, your sinuses really well, <laughs> Uh, this kills baby weeds really good. You know, if they just start sprouting and you go through with this, you wipe them out. Now, we found this product recently, 47%. So this is a really, if you want to clean your concrete, this, this will do a good job too. So these are considered organic controls because they're made by bacteria. But boy, they're, they're chemical grade. And you have to, pardon? Oh yeah, any any plant you touch this on will burn the leaf. Uh, but it's not a systemic, so it doesn't kill, you know, if you just hit one leaf, you just kill that leaf. You won't kill the whole plant. So in that way, it's not too bad. Uh, only in that it kills the plants you touch. But if the weed is mature, it doesn't, you know, if you don't kill the roots and everything, you, you don't kill it. So just baby weeds, you can go through it. Now, the other problem with this is it makes your soil real acidic if you do it too many times. 
So we only do it once in a while. Here at the nursery, I'll do it once in a while. But if you, well, in the nursery, it's not a big deal because we don't, we're not growing stuff in the ground. But in your own garden, if you do this too many times, like if I spray this in a container pot, after, if I do it more than once, the plant starts getting messed up by the fact that the soil is highly acidic now. Nice to do it once because our soil is alkaline here. Our water is alkaline. Everything's alkaline. But if you do it too many times, uh, it'll make this un the soil not support your plant fruits either. Yeah, but you have to be careful how much you use. So normally, I think it would be about one tablespoon or one ounce per gallon of water. It's really acidic. <laughs> um, and you just flush it through. I mean, you can use store vinegar for that. It's safer. 5% yeah, vinegar. Um, now, when you use this stuff, you have to watch what sprayer you're putting in. I totally destroyed a rigorous sprayer by putting this in there. So you have to get one that says chemical resistant. I don't have any on these on the shelf to sell at the moment. I have to get some more in. These are like 20 bucks. But the seals are all resistant to acids. Whereas ones like this or this, they'll last maybe a month after you use the vinegar and then they just, the seals don't seal anymore. <laughs> So yeah, do have to, or if you wash them out really good after, right after you use it, but if you don't wash it out, the chemicals eat up all the seals. So. Oh, this will kill. It'll kill the leaves and grass, but it'll grow back. That's the thing. We kill a if we spray this on a mature grass plant, it'll burn all the leaves off, but it won't kill it because the growing part of the grass is underground, so it'll grow back. So if you had some soft weeds on your lawn and you hit this once, you'll, you'll certainly brown your grass out, but it will grow back. But uh, be careful. It's, you're only supposed to use it on things you don't want. Yes. Well, it does. It has no residual, so it, they can come up again. But and if and they've got to be young to kill them really well. Well, there's nothing organic that'll do it. I mean, you know, if you put pea gravel down that's at least three inches thick, that stop. You know, that makes the weeds you get really easy to pull out if it's three inches thick, if they can't grab on anything that holds them in the ground. I used to have a walkway that was three inches of gravel. Hardly any weeds, and the weeds are there. You just, they're real easy to pull out. Yeah, the landscape fabric that sold, the weeds will grow on top of it. And it doesn't do a thing after a while. Because we used to have, at our old store, we had an acre of, land, of, of landscape fabric on the ground to stop the weeds. If anything fell on that, a few... You know, some gravel or a little bit of dirt. The weeds grew on top of the weed block. So the weed block did nothing. All the weed block can do is stop the weeds from, that are underneath it from coming through. But any dirt on top of the weed block, it still grows. So the weed block for most homeowners does nothing. Just a real thick layer of gravel or bark or straw. You know, anytime you have the ground covered that deep with something that doesn't stay wet, the weeds can't start in it. Still, though, the weeds can't really grow in that stuff. I know it didn't seem to grow too well in it. Well, gravel, gravel for you says the weed block is, is, is longer lasting. That'll last for a decade or more. So 
In the long run, it's better, but in the short run, it's real expensive. Getting gravel to your house is quite, quite expensive. So, but I love the way it looks. The especially the um, the river gravel. Not you know they make pea gravel that's this crushed rock, and that's not easy to walk on. But the river gravel with the rounded pieces, that's nice, and it looks cool. I actually used to grow my lettuce in the gravel because they'd grow in it in the winter time uh, and it was clean. <laughs> no, no dirt on the on the okay, so I don't know if that's supplier. I mean, we get the garden straw. We get says it's or you know it's healthy straw. It's not been sprayed with anything. Uh, now the we can get the straw we have is garden grade straw. There is straw that's really cheap. That's bedding straw that we can also get from the same company. It's it's a lot cheaper. Like we saw these bales out that we have thirty-four dollars or something a bale. For ten dollars less, we can sell the animal straw, the bedding straw, but uh, they didn't take the seeds out. So you'll get oats or wheat growing coming up in your garden if you use the bedding straw. Mm, well, hopefully they don't. I don't know. I don't. I haven't heard of that. You know, if it's from wheat, they shouldn't be using really nasty chemicals on that. Although they can use, I guess, since it is a grass, in theory, they could use a broadleaf weed killer in wheat. Yeah. yeah well, broadleaf weed killers apparently supposedly don't hurt animals because. They're only killing, there, there is some hormone that makes the uh, broadleaf plants grow crazy but uh, until they die, but still I wouldn't re recommend it. So get, get something that's considered organic. So. Okay, so diseases we mentioned a bit about keeping them dry. Uh, now, just so you know, um, like in rose gardens, in the past, Every winter, the practice was to clean out all the dead leaves and spray um, lime sulfur in the ground to sterilize the ground uh, to prevent any of the spores that are lingering in your garden from coming back onto your plants. But when they actually tested that, they said it wasn't worthwhile doing because um, once the leaves are on the ground for a while, the spores on them, the disease spores are killed off by all the bacteria on the ground. And um, there's so many spores floating in the air that it didn't make any difference. So cleaning up the ground is not as important as it has been, although fresh dead leaves or diseased leaves, yeah, you want to get rid of those on your plant. So one of the things you like, if you have tomatoes with black spots in the leaves, cut them all off, just the parts that have the black spots, that's the disease that you want, don't want on your plant and get rid of it. Uh, keep it away from your garden. I mean, uh, we were next to an organic farm for four years and their employees would walk through the field with little buckets and they would pick off diseased leaves, especially on strawberries and diseased berries and that's how they would control the problems is they would just pick them off. Now, Powdery mildew, last year was a huge problem. Um, it's a this kind of white haze that forms on leaves of things like broccoli and cauliflower and um, peas and squash, pumpkins, 
roses, grapes get it right on the fruit and cracks them open. Uh, we actually have powder mildew on apple foliage, which doesn't hurt them that bad. Uh, and on our peach trees last year, we had powder mildew. It was just horrible. Last year was the worst mildew year we've ever seen. And on the roses, the chemical controls just weren't working. So we finally went back to our original way we used to control mildew with an oil mixed with baking soda. So the concentration we're using, so the mineral oil, mineral oil tends to kill mildew on contact. I don't, powder mildew is a surface organism, not like, like rust is inside the leaf, a black spot, a lot of diseases are inside the leaf. Mildew is on top of the leaf, and if you put oil on it, it tends to just kill it. Um, they're using four tablespoons in a gallon of water, along with baking soda. Which was one tablespoon along with it in the same gallon of water. Uh, baking soda is highly alkaline and it messes up the disease spores. And we're doing this. So back in the 80s, when we didn't have the newer diseases and bugs, this is all we ever did in our roses. Once a week, we would hit them with this oil and that baking soda, and there'd be no bugs, no diseases. I mean, they look fabulous. And then, then the downy came in, and the thrips, the new thrips came in. We had to switch and go to chemicals again. <laughs> but uh, for most homeowners, this 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 combination is pretty nice. Now, just so you know, for all spring, um, what the books recommend is that if you're spraying for a certain pest, hit it with the same product twice and then switch. Because what will happen is that the bugs that you... So most things like the spinach that we mentioned, the study showed that it kills 94% of the population of thrips. So the 6% that are not killed by it their population starts building up. So if you don't switch, <clears throat> eventually you'll just have a lot of thrips that don't get killed by that product anymore. So a good, a good routine is oil one week and something else the next. If you, if you have a real bad bug problem with, then, you know, spinosad one week and then oil the next. And that will pretty much control any bug in your garden. Because <laughs> this kills a lot of bugs too. And hopefully it kills the ones that this one doesn't kill. Or one of the other oils. The neem oil. The, the Dr. Earth essential oils. Uh, if, you, if you change what you're spraying now and then. Or alternately it helps. Uh, the oil spray is the best thing you can do. In, in, a, in an organic garden on your vegetables and your fruit trees, if you get the white flies, the oil spray. And you can put the baking soda with it too. Uh, baking soda might deter insects also. But, um, and certainly with squash, you get mildew on them, so that does help too. So... You just remind me of another pest. What was it?
there any other questions? I lost my train of thought there. I was going to talk about one more pest. Is there anyone, I mean, I, I'm pretty much in the drive there. Is there anyone, should I be treating my garden proactively? Or should I treat it only as it comes up, as the problem comes up? We rarely treat things proactively. I mean, there's only a few pests you know when they're going to show up. So on citrus, the leaf miners, we've never seen them the day before summer starts. But when summer starts, they just explode on the citrus trees. Yeah, and this lasts, and the spindle sad lasts two weeks on the plant, so you can hit it. A week before summer starts, and you'll start. You'll control the leaf miners on the citrus. Yeah. Now there are um, insect traps that you can buy too. Unfortunately, all the insect traps are made for the male, not the females. Males are attracted to the smell of females, I guess. So <clears throat> the traps are only for the males. Um, the traps work on farms better than they do in homes. So the traps that we have, the lures that is that that kill the male moths and the male whatever, um, if you don't use enough of them in your neighborhood, and you only kill like citrus leaf miner, we have the citrus leaf miner traps. We tried them; they do nothing because they killed the male moths on your in your yard that hatch out, but not the females. And if you don't control all the females being born in your neighbor's yards and it hardly does the thing in your yard. But if you, if your whole neighborhood puts these lures out, yeah, you get the population down of the female uh, leaf miners. Uh, the white fly traps we sell too. Um, they say outside they're not as effective as in a greenhouse, say, because it's the color that attracts them. So you put this chartreuse yellow thing in your garden and all the white flies in the neighborhood see it and come running. So they said it doesn't help that much in a garden setup. But if you have a greenhouse with white fly in it and you put these chartreuse traps in there, you'll attract them all, all the, uh, the, the fungus gnats and other bugs that are attracted to this will come and get stuck to, the, to those uh, sticky traps. Well, try the Dr. Earth products. So the leaf footed bugs are big bugs. I mean, the oils work better on small bugs, they don't move so fast, so they can't outrun the oil it just you know if you bugs breathe through their skin or through pores in their bodies so if they're small and the oil covers them they can't escape it but the leaf-footed bugs a big bug so it, it can just walk a bit and probably get shake the oil off itself but try the essentials and see because i don't know what else would work uh now the bigger you know they can still do damage though unless Unless you see hundreds of them, they're not doing horrible damage, but they can still disfigure small fruits. That's the thing. Um, okay, I just thought of another one, and I lost my train of thought again. <laughs> um, oh, the, uh, the green June bugs. <clears throat> so the fig beetles, we call them, are green June bugs, those big metallic beetles that fly around and go after uh, ripe fruit. So they like ripe fruit the best. They'll actually eat anything that smells fruity, including rose buds. So a friend of mine <clears throat> showed me a trap he came up with. And he was he said he was collecting about 30 a day. So he just got a uh, plastic container, plastic bottle, and cut it in half. So he cut the top off and inverted it, made a little funnel out of it. I think he had enlarged the hole a little bit. So it's kind of like this. 
and he put grape juice in here. And he hung this, he had holes in it with the string on it, and hung this in his fig tree. And he was collecting 30 fig beetles a day in there. So they like, uh, you know, they like ripe fruit, the smell of ripe fruit, and they like fermenting fruit too. So grape juice, uh, maybe some wine will work even better. <clears throat> but they can drop into this stuff and they can't fly out. And that's the way a lot of insect traps work, they're funnels, because the bugs and beetles can fly in, but they can't, and the moths can fly in, but they can't, or they can drop in, but they can't fly out. <clears throat> it, well, in theory, it can. <clears throat> There's mosquito traps. We sell one where um, it gives off, um, I don't know, it's supposed to give off a certain odor. I mean, the, the best mosquito traps out there are pretty expensive. You know, they run in a couple thousand dollars, but they have a... Um, uh, uh, propane tank on, on them, which makes them a little dangerous, and they burn propane, and they also are, are electrified. So this thing's burning propane, which gives off carbon dioxide and water vapor, which is what we do. So the mosquitoes think this machine's a person breathing, and then it's got electrical grid, and they said that'll clean up the whole backyard, one of those contraptions, because it's, you know, it just sits there and it's giving off carbon dioxide and water vapor. So um, that's supposed to work the best of all the mosquito. And there's several brands out there that you can buy on the internet, but they're all fairly pricey and they can be a little bit, because they involve propane tanks, they can be a little dangerous too. So I just remembered another thing I was going to talk about. Um, the one we have says it gives off carbon dioxide, but we don't trap as many as we'd like in it. And I still keep one of those uh, electrocution wands by my desk. Yeah. They're really cheap at Harbor Freight, just so you know. And it's real satisfying to hear the zap. Yeah. <clears throat> So just so you know, uh, the other way they they promote to, to kill weeds is with torches. They don't work. Now, I was told they would work if you put welder's gas in them. But the pro I tried a propane one, and you, you, you put the torch right on the grass weed, and it sits, and you, you're there for a minute before it starts to burn. You have to hold that thing there for a minute before those leaves start to actually look like they're burning it's just not hot enough the propane torches yeah so i was told water gases are a thousand degrees when they're burning so they would kill it in an instant but that's a lot more dangerous to put in your closet than uh, a propane tank but even propane tanks you wouldn't want to keep in your house <clears throat> just an outside closet somewhere so those things haven't worked but again i guess if you had the right type of gas in them they would but, uh... Okay, any other questions today? I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the oil's basically not, unless you totally, well, the bee just flies out of the oil, so it's not a big deal. The spinel said if you hit the bee, you'll kill it. If you actually hit the bee. Once it's on the plant and it's not a liquid anymore, it just dries on the plant. It doesn't hurt the bee at all. So you have to avoid spraying the bee. Once, if you avoid spraying the bee, you won't kill it. Right. Right. Um, well, there's also, of course, rats, rodents. Um, Squirrels are hard. Squirrels are really hard to control. The, the Refru Growers Club in the area organization, they, their members know how to get these squirrel crushers. 
uh, they said they're PVC pipes with the trap inside. The squirrels walk in there and it kills them, and they can't see it being killed. <laughs> <coughs> so that's what they use. Uh, I haven't gotten a hold of one of those. I've trapped a few squirrels in cages and then just drove them five miles away and let them go, which are not, which is illegal to do. But there's nobody, there's no animal police that'll probably stop you if you do that. I used to let them go at a park, but. Um, they're hard to control. Rats and mice a lot easier because bubble gum kills them. So if you haven't tried that method yet, it kills a lot of rats and mice. So they eat it, it doesn't digest, they can't vomit it up. So most other animals, including squirrels, if they eat something that's not digestible, they just vomit it up. Birds of prey do that. They eat, they eat a squirrel and the bones, they just regurgitate them. Um, so bubble gum is safe around predators because they can regurgitate the, the, the bubble gum, but apparently rats, mice, and gophers, those three things can't regurgitate, and it, they starve to death in three days. It, we didn't think it, we didn't know how it was going to work. I mean, we, we had heard about it, and then five years later, we tried, finally tried it, we put, like, my daughter put five unwrapped pieces of bubble gum. She unwrapped them and put them on our block wall so our dog couldn't reach them. And three days later, I'll go walking by the wall, and there's two dead rats and a dead mouse laying on the ground. We're going, ah, oh, that stuff works really fast. Doesn't kill squirrels. Yeah, apparently, the, if they eat it, they can just regurgitate it. So, yeah, we tried it, we tried it, it didn't work, unfortunately. So. Somebody <laughs> Yeah, just put bubble gum. It can't be anything minty. So juicy fruit has worked, uh, and then the bubble gums, which are fruity, also work. They don't like mint, you know. And it's got to be something with sugar and not artificial sweeteners. Um, the other thing, uh, first, there's for bird problems. There's bird netting, which is a pain to work with because it gets stuck on your plants. But if you support it off. So we've had customers who show me they bought these um, structures on the internet that are like seven foot high, uh, eight foot wide, and 15 foot long. It comes with bird netting that fits over it with the, with the zipper door. So you can grow uh, vegetables and fruits in there. The bees can fly through this, but not the birds or the squirrels. But they said that company went out of business. I guess they didn't sell enough of it. But there are setups we can get from our supplier. Well, they have this raised planter bed that fits poles on it with netting over it. So you can get that. Now, um, there's two kinds of netting. There's this kind of netting that the bees can go through. So insects can get in, but not birds or squirrels. And there's this other netting that bugs can get through. So there's a netting that's real fine. This is an organza bag from uh, like Michael's. Um, so there's this netting you can get that you can get big pieces of it that'll fit over the entire plant. And if you want to grow good uh, broccoli, cauliflower, leaf crops, uh, uh, root crops, you can cover them with, cover an entire bed with this stuff and no bugs can get in. You can't grow things that require bees, though. The bees, you can't put this, although they say with squash, a lot of times they'll put this on until the squash plants start blooming, and then they'll uncover it so the bees can get in there and do the pollination. So, citrus, they're covering entire trees with this in Florida and in California to keep that psyllid off of them that spreads the, the, the fatal disease. Citrus do not need bees. The bees love citrus flowers, but the citrus are all self-pollinating uh, fruit. They don't require bees. In fact, a lot of, of the orchards don't want bees near them because sometimes it makes the fruit get seeds, which, which we don't want in citrus. <clears throat> so you can, we can order um, this material that will cover entire rows of crops. I don't, I don't have any in stock. But we can get them. It's like, you know, you have to buy like 300 feet of it, unfortunately. Um, 
but you can get netting that'll keep all the bugs out, all the pests out you want. So there are setups like that. Um, also for birds, the infallible snake works really well for a couple weeks. So this is a blow-up snake. <clears throat> now, I bought, when I was younger, I bought this real realistic looking rubber snake. <clears throat> that was about this big. It was a rubber rattlesnake, and it was about this real realistic looking. So that was the first, before they made these. I had heard that birds don't like snakes. So I had 20 fig trees in it, you know, middle of summer, late summer. It's not, it sounded like an aviary in my backyard. It was just, you know, dozens of birds there in my backyard at all times. We hung the, the rubber snake in one of the trees. Didn't hear a bird for two weeks. <laughs> They did not like the snake. So this, this one's not quite as realistic, but still, anything that looks like a snake in your garden, uh, this is a six-foot blow-up snake. You won't see a bird for over a week. And if you keep moving it religiously, the birds will think it's real, <clears throat> and they won't come in. If you just leave it there, they get used to it after a while. Now, a lot of organic farms... Or our farmers in general will see this scare tape in, uh, in action. So this is a mirror mylar tape that's silver on one side and on the other. The proper way to use this is to string it horizontally for distance. Not just hang it. String it horizontally for distance because when you go up to Napa Valley and they have this all over the place when the grapes are on the plants, um, the slightest breeze makes this tape flip from one side to the other slowly. And the red and the silver just zings back and forth. You know, 50 miles an hour is going this way, this way, this way. The birds hate that movement, seeing the red and the silver streaking back and forth constantly. Um, if you just hang it straight down, it doesn't do as much. It's still, they don't like the reflections that come off it. But if you hang it horizontally for distance, it is it is pretty amazing sight. I mean, it, it bothers you to look at it. Even you, you just, you're just you in your backyard, you see this thing going like this, back and forth across the yard. <clears throat> it's visually distracting, which the birds hate. So that, that can work for a long time, too. That's everything I've got. Any other questions? All right. All right.